اللہ دین امن دوز ہو بلیو و امین ہاتھ اینڈ رائٹ چس ڈیز تو بہم اے گڈ اسٹیٹ فار دیم و حسن و معب اینڈ اے گڈ ریٹرن فار دیم دیر از طوبا وٹ از طوبا طوبا از فیمن آف اطیب ایز اے ورڈ اٹس اے فیمن آف اطیب اطیب اف لائک احسن اکبر اصغر سو دا فیمن آف دیر از کبرا سغرا اوکے حسن And here we have Tuba. Okay, so Tuba is the feminine form of Atiyab. And Atiyab is from Tayyab. Tayyab means to be good and Atiyab means to be very good, very excellent, very pure. So Tuba, feminine version of that. So for them is Tuba meaning a very, very good result. A very good state. When? In this life and also in the Akhir. They will have Tuba. They will be in a good state. They will enjoy all types of blessings, happiness, comfort, coolness of the eye. In this life, their state will be good. At the time of death, their state will be good. In the grave, their state will be good. In the akhirah, they will have a good outcome. Tuba lahum. And Tuba is also, from a hadith, we learned that it's a tree in Jannah. So for them is Tuba. Wa husnu ma'ab. And an excellent return meaning a good place where they will return an excellent outcome kadhalika arsalnaka thus we have sent to you o prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam fi ummatin in a community qad khalat min qabliha ummun before which other communities have passed on meaning we have sent you to your nation the people of makkah and before them many people have lived on the earth meaning just as the people of the past they lived their lives and they went likewise your nation is also going to come to an end one day qad khalat min qabliha ummun but why have you been sent litatlu alayhim so that you may recite upon them what should you recite to them alladhi awhayna ilayka that which we have revealed to you meaning we have sent to you so that you deliver the quran we have sent you to them so that you deliver the quran to them we have sent you as a messenger so that you recite the quran to your people and this should be the way of every follower of the messenger if he wants and he must call people to allah then how should he do that by reciting the quran to people وَهُمْ يَكْفُرُونَ بِالرَّحْمَانِ And they disbelieve in Ar-Rahman. You see the mushrikeen, they believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But whenever they would hear the name of Allah, Ar-Rahman, they would get really upset. They get really agitated. It's like they were bothered by the name Ar-Rahman. They would say, only call him Allah, don't say Ar-Rahman. It's like, you know, these days, if you say Allah, there are some people who get really offended. They say, use the word god don't say allah the fact is that the same allah is god whether you accept or not so ar rahman is another name of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but the mushrikeen they would not like it at all and this is why we see that at the treaty of hudaybiyah when ar rahman was mentioned they wanted it to be removed bismillahir rahmanir rahim when it was written they wanted ar rahman ar rahim to be removed They just wanted the name of Allah to be present. When they were told, the mushrikeen were told, prostrate to Ar-Rahman, they would get really upset and angry. So, وَهُمْ يَكْفُرُونَ بِالرَّحْمَانِ When somebody is so biased, like they pick on such things and they oppose you just because of the name Ar-Rahman, just because of the name Allah, then what should you do? Just rise above that. Allah says, tell them, قُلْ سَيْ هُوَ رَبِّي He is my Lord. Whether you accept Him as Ar-Rahman or not, He is my Lord. لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ There is no God worthy of worship but Him. عَلَيْهِ تَوَكَّلْتُ On Him I trust. وَإِلَيْهِ مَتَاب And to Him is my return. مَتَاب is from تَوَوْبَ تَوْبْ To return. So مَتَاب, place of return. وَلَوْ أَنَّ قُرْآنًا And if there was a Qur'an, if there was some recitation, Quran literally means what? To recite, recitation. So if there was any recitation, suyirat, by which it would be removed, it would be set in motion, bihi, by it, meaning by that recitation, what would be set in motion? Al-jibalu, the mountains. Suyirat, from sin yara, sayr. What does sayr mean? To travel, to move. 
So suyirat, so it is made to travel, it is made to move. Meaning any recitation by which mountains are moved, mountains are set in motion, mountains are removed. أو قطعت به الأرض Or such a powerful recitation by which the earth is قطعت It is cut, it is broken apart. Such a powerful recitation that would break the earth apart. أو كلم به الموتى Or such a powerful recitation by which the dead are made to speak. Now, meaning such a powerful kalam that would cause such great Affects, it would affect so much that the mountains are set in motion, the earth is cut up, dead people come alive and they start talking. Then was it possible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do that? Of course. Of course. Because Quran is whose kalam? Whose speech is it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's speech. And if He wants to say kun, and as a result the mountains start moving, if He says kun and the earth is split, if He says kun and the dead start talking, Is it possible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Of course. So the word kun is Allah's kalam. The Qur'an is also Allah's kalam. It's possible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cause this to happen by the Qur'an also. But he chose not to. Because you see, this is what many people want. Do nothing yourself. Nothing yourself. Just read the Qur'an and wait for miracles. Wait for great things to happen. The mushrikeen demanded something like that also. He said, what kind of miracle are you showing to us? You're saying Qur'an is miracle? We want to see something like the staff of Musa which you throw and the sea is separated. This is what they wanted to see. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the Qur'an is also a miracle. You think it is less of a miracle? You think it is not good enough? You think the Qur'an is not impressive? The Qur'an is a living miracle that has so much effect that literally if there was any Qur'an, any recitation that would cause such changes to occur, it would have been this Qur'an. It would have been this Qur'an. There is no other kalam that is more powerful than this speech, than this Qur'an. And you see, in this Qur'an, there is Surah Al-Fatiha. And about Surah Al-Fatiha, we learned that there is no surah like it that was revealed in the Torah or the Injil. No surah like it. It is the most unique scripture, the most unique kalam, the most powerful kalam. And the best thing is this Qur'an is a living miracle, it's an eternal miracle. The staff of Musa alayhi salam, the Bani Israel present at that time, they saw it. And yes, they saw the 12 springs coming out of that big rock because Musa alayhi salam struck it with the staff, right? Musa alayhi salam threw the staff, it turned into a snake and it gobbled up all of the snakes of the magicians. But the Bani Israelites that came after Musa a.s., did they get to see the miracle? Did they? They only heard stories, right? But the Qur'an, the Qur'an, the people of Mecca, the Sahaba, those people living at the time of the Prophet a.s., they saw its effects and today even we see its effects. So never undermine the miraculous nature of the Qur'an. It is a miracle. Allah says, وَلَوْ أَنَّ قُرْآنًا سُيِّرَتْ بِهِ الْجِبَالُ أَوْ قُطِّعَتْ بِهِ الْأَرْضُ أَوْ كُلِّمَ بِهِ الْمَوْتَى And the answer is not mentioned, it's implied. And what is it? That it would have been this Qur'an. Do not underestimate the Qur'an. بَلْ لِلَّهِ الْأَمْرُ جَمِيعًا Rather to Allah belongs the affair entirely. All command, the power to decide is His. He decides. If he wanted, he could have taken this work from the Qur'an. That's The Prophet ﷺ would recite the Qur'an and the mountains would start crumbling down. Possible. You know, a person would recite a verse from the Qur'an and amazing things would happen. Like we wish would happen. Or we see things happening, you know, in movies. That somebody is reading a few words and, you know, magic is happening. And this is how people want the Qur'an to work also. بَلْ لِلَّهِ الْأَمْرُ جَمِيعًا Allah could have taken this work from the Qur'an, but He chose not to, because the Qur'an is for guidance. Qur'an is hidayah. It is for guidance. It is not for the purpose of showing such miracles, such great events. And you see, what is that really brings a change in a person? True change. Seeing something impressive? Hmm? Seeing a mountain collapsing? No, true change comes from where? From within. From within. أَفَلَمْ يَيْأَسِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا 
those people who have believed, have they not despaired? Yayas from Ya Hamza Seen. Yes. Remember we learned earlier, La Tayasu Mir Rahmatillah. Do not despair from the mercy of Allah. Hmm? Because He does not despair from the mercy of Allah except those who are disbelievers. So, Afalam Yayas al Ladina Amanu. Have they not despaired? Meaning, have they not given up already? Have the believers not given up? Meaning, don't they accept it already? That Allah Yasha Allah, if Allah wanted Lahad al Nasa Jami'ah, He would have guided all people. Because you see, the Muslims, what did they want? That the mushrikeen are asking for miracles. Why doesn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala show just one miracle? And it would be all so easy. People will believe. People will believe. Was it difficult for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show a miracle? Was it difficult for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cause Mount Safa to turn into gold? No. It wasn't difficult at all. If Allah wanted, it would have happened many, many times before the eyes of the mushrikeen. But Allah decided not to do that. Why? Because true iman cannot come by seeing a mountain turn into gold. You can be impressed to that moment, you can have that wow feeling, but then after a few moments, what happens? It's gone. It's finished. So if Allah wanted, He could have forced people to believe. But He does not force to believe. So all believers realize and accept this fact that all people are not going to believe. There is always going to be believers and also disbelievers. And those who disbelieve despite the truth being evident, remember, وَلَا يَزَالُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَلَا يَزَالُ And he will not cease, meaning always they will remain. Who? الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا The disbelievers. تُصِيبَهُمْ It will reach them. بِمَا صَنَعُوا Because of what they have done. What will reach them? Always because of what they have done. لا يزالوا mean this will continue to happen. They will always receive something because of what they have done. What? قَارِعَةٌ A قَارِعَة What is قَارِعَة? A calamity. قَافْ رَعِينَ قَرَعَة قَرَعَة is basically to knock. قَرَعَ الْبَاب To knock on the door. So قَارِعَة is such a calamity in which there is a lot of noise. A lot of noise. So these people, because of their disbelief, forever and always, they will continue to receive some calamity because of their actions. Oh, or the hullu, it will descend, meaning some qari'a, some disaster, some calamity, will always descend qariba min darihim, close to their homes. If not on their homes, in their neighborhoods. It will continue to befall them. Hatta yati wa'dullah, until the promise of Allah will come, meaning the promise of victory that Allah had made with the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Inna Allah la yukhliful mi'ad, Allah does not go against His promise. If Allah has promised victory to His Messenger, He will give it. Yes, at the moment it doesn't seem like it. At the moment when the Prophet ﷺ was in Mecca, it didn't seem like he was going to be victorious anytime soon. It seemed as though Islam would completely extinguish any day. But Allah had promised victory. And the victory did come eventually. Now what do we learn in this ayah? That... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will deal with the disbelievers. He will punish them for what they're doing. He will punish them. So you leave that punishment to him. But the Prophet sallallahu and the Sahaba, what were they told to do meanwhile? Just sit and wait for things to happen? Is that what the Prophet sallallahu was advised to do in Makkah? Is that what he was told to do in Makkah? Just sit in your home, go sit in the haram, and just keep watching the mushrikeen. You know, some calamity is going to fall from the sky or the earth is going to gobble them up or something's going to happen. Yeah? No. The Prophet ﷺ was told, you keep conveying. The believers were told, you keep conveying. And you leave the hisab with Allah. You have to do your job. Don't worry about the punishment that has to come on the disbelievers. That is Allah's decision. He will give it to them. But, when he wants. You have to focus on your work. And this is a very important lesson that we Muslims need to learn. Because literally, we wait for miracles to happen. We want that a natural disaster should happen. And as a result, all the enemies of Islam, all the enemies that we have in our lives should finish. And we don't have to do nothing. We can just sit back and relax. No! You have to do your part of the work. Leave the rest with Allah. Look at the hardships that the Prophet ﷺ endured in Makkah. 
Did he not have to leave his home and go to Medina? Did he not have to suffer so much, you know, hearing so much from the mushrikeen, bearing all those hardships that came from them? He had to. But success doesn't come except in that way. Success will only come through hard work. So you have to do your part and leave the rest to Allah. And remember, وَلَقَدْ اسْتُهْزِئَ بِرُسُلٍ And certainly messengers were ridiculed. Which messengers? مِنْ قَبْلِكْ Before you. Before you, O Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa messengers came and they were ridiculed by their people. فَأَمْلَيْتُ So I gave respite. أَمْلَيْتُ مِيمْ لَامْ وَاو مَلْ مَلْ is to give time, give length to the rope you know, of an animal, extend it so that it can go far and do whatever it wants. So أَمْلَيْتُ I gave time. To who? To the disbelievers. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala let them make fun of the messengers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala let them mock at his religion. He let them. He allowed them to do it. He gave them time. He let them persecute the believers. He let them torture the believers. Think about the Bani Israel. Did they not suffer at the hands of Fir'aun? For so many years? Did Fir'aun not laugh at Musa a.s. and the Bani Israel, his people? Of course they did. فَأَمْلَيْتُ لِلَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا ثُمَّ أَخَسْتُهُمْ Then when the right time came, I seized them. فَكَيْفَ كَانَ عِقَابْ Then how terrible was my penalty? So why don't they take a lesson from history? Why don't the people of Mecca take a lesson from history? Why don't they look at the past and see what happened to the previous nations? They lived their lives. They enjoyed their time. They made fun of Haq. They made fun of the messengers. They opposed the messengers. But ultimately, victory was given to who? Those who were upon the Haq. أَفَمَنْ هُوَ قَائِمٌ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ نَفْسِ Then is he who is a maintainer of every soul. قَائِم He is قَائِم قَائِم is who? Literally one who is standing. And over here it means one who is maintaining, guarding, watching over who? كُلِّ نَفْسِ Every soul. بِمَا كَسَبَتْ For what it has earned. Meaning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is watching over every servant, every person. He knows exactly what every human being is doing. He knows about what every person is thinking, what he's saying. Is he like any other? Think about it. Is he like any other? The one who is aware of everything, everyone. Is he like any other? No. Is there any comparison? No. Yet, وَجَعَلُوا لِلَّهِ شُرَكَاء But to Allah they have attributed partners. What kind of shuraka? What kind of partners? Those who don't even possess sight. Who cannot even see. Who don't even know themselves. If they don't know themselves, if they cannot even see, then how can they watch over people? How can they take care of them? How can they maintain their affairs? وَجَعَلُوا لِلَّهِ شُرَكَاء Allah says, قُلْ say سَمُّوهُمْ Name them. Name who? Your shuraka, the gods that you believe in. Meaning describe them. Tell us who they are. Name them. You see, a name, what kind of a name? A name that befits and rightfully describes these gods of yours. Any name, when it's given to something, it befits that object. Like for example, this thing here. Can I call it a chair? Can I give the name chair to this? Why? Because it's not a chair. Can it be used as a chair? I mean, I could try, but I better be lucky. Hmm? So it cannot be called a chair. If I call it a chair, that's a lie. That's not correct. It's not right at all. This thing, can this be called a chair? Why? Because it has the qualities of a chair. Right? It has a seat, it has legs, it has a back. Yes, this can be called a chair. This cannot be called a chair. Someone can argue, well, this even has four legs and you can sit here. But it's not a chair. It's close to it, but it's not a chair. Now, so many things, beings, people call them God. Do they have the qualities of God? Do they have the attributes of God? Surah Al-Ikhlas tells us about who God is. Ahad. الصمد الذي لم يلد 
ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا احد who possesses these qualities other than Allah nobody so this is why Allah says قل سموهم tell them name them name them names that truly befit them that rightfully describe them but the fact is that there's no one who possesses the qualities of God except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala no one but him am tunabbi'unahu or do you inform him are you trying to tell Allah bima of that which la ya'lamu he does not know fil ardi in the earth meaning are you trying to inform Allah about some other gods whereas Allah doesn't know that they exist in the earth and Allah has complete knowledge and if it's not in his knowledge then that means that they don't exist am bi zahirin min al or is it that bi zahirin min al or that which is apparent of speech zahir zahir is what that which is apparent on the surface meaning it's just words that you have fabricated that you have trumped up without any evidence you are just saying that this thing made of stone is a god or this human being is a son of god or this cow is god you're just making things up it's zahir min al qawl it's just words and if it's just words without any evidence then how can these things have any reality to them how can you believe in them as god bal zuyyina lil ladina kafaru makruhum rather for the disbelievers their plot has been made beautiful what plot their lies this zahir qawl it's all a game of words they called something god and then they made up a story and another story and another myth and it continued they wrote they narrated they elaborated it even more it's just a makr and it's been made so beautiful for them that they're you know they cry when their gods are mentioned there's no reality to it was suddu an as-sabil and they were prevented from the way which way the right way وَمَنْ يُضْلِلِ اللَّهُ And the one who Allah lets to go astray فَمَا لَهُ مِنْ هَاتْ Then he has no guide. He has no one to guide him. You know when you read about the different beliefs that people have about God and sometimes within Muslims also there are certain people who call themselves Muslim but they have such deviated beliefs which are far from Islam, far from the belief of Tawheed. You wonder, did they ever think that people will have a hard time believing their stories like really the stories that people have made are so ridiculous i mean you wonder did they think twice about making up those stories but the sad thing is that we love lies i mean people love to watch so many movies and what are they based on lies lies if you're ever watching tv the worst person you can have next to you is me because i cannot help but comment really i cannot it's just ridiculous it's so far from reality even the apparent reality shows are so far from reality because there's no truth to them it's just zuyina it's just made beautiful even movies i mean so ridiculous these storylines are so senseless it's all lies who came up with it and who passed it and who spent millions of dollars making it up and who is spending all this money to watch come on we are in a culture of lies we speak them we accept them we watch them we believe in them uh, someone said to me recently that uh, these movies are made in such a way and they're made so attractive and beautiful that they cause people and they encourage them to suspend their belief for a short amount of time mm-hmm. to just leave your beliefs you know what you believe in for the time that you're watching this movie forget about it and just enjoy because it's so much fun it's so good so like just someone was commenting recently that even in television and film it doesn't reflect reality even a little bit even if you look at the races because almost everyone is white in movies and TV and sometimes there's black people but you rarely see Asians or brown people or muslims or you know disabled people or it just doesn't reflect the real world at all so. at so many levels it doesn't reflect the real world um, i was thinking about when i remember that i was talking to a muslim once and i was asking them that there was something where they were saying how god gave us his only son jesus and show him what he loves us so i said okay if god gave us his son jesus and his god like jesus is god But, but isn't he the son of God? He's like, no, Jesus is God. Who gave up the son? And I realized that they were so strong in this belief. I'm like, this doesn't make a lick of sense. Because if God had a son, why would he give up the son? 
And then who's the son? <laughs> But unfortunately, what happens is that when a person, he hears something once and he sees it and he reads it, when he's surrounded by it, he begins to believe in it. And that is beautiful to him. And that is what makes sense to him, unfortunately. In Dora Quran, we were talking about the things that are unseen to us. So basically, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions them in the Quran, right? So our teachers mentioned that we watch so many dramas and movies that our ears have become sensitive to lies. So even when we hear the truth, we think of it as a lie. So we don't believe it. Because of all these lies, we tend to believe in lies and we tend to doubt the truth. There's a series called The Walking Dead and it takes them, it makes no sense, and it takes them about $2 million dollars to make each episode, but so many people watch it that they make $18 million from commercial revenue. Wow. In Hellfire, when people will be going in, what will they say? لَوْ كُنَّا نَسْمَعُ أَوْ نَعْقِلُ If only we heard or we used some sense, we would not be of the people of the fire today. If only we used our mind, Because even logically, shirk does not make sense. If you analyze it, just dig it a little bit, it doesn't make sense. So this aql that Allah has given to people, if they don't use it, there's serious consequences. لَهُمْ عَذَابٌ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا For them is punishment in the life of this world. وَلَا عَذَابُ الْآخِرَةِ أَشَقْ And the punishment of the hereafter is surely أَشَقْ It is more severe, it is more difficult. وَمَا لَهُمْ مِنَ اللَّهِ مِنْ وَاقٍ And they will not have from Allah any protector, anyone to save them. وَاقٍ From وَاقَافِيَا Taqwa is also from the same root, to take protection. So, مَا لَهُمْ مِنَ اللَّهِ مِنْ وَاقٍ No one will come and shield them. No one will come and protect them. You see, taqwa is also to take a shield, right? In battle. So no one will shield them from the fire. No savior. For who? For those who don't use their aql. For those who surround themselves with lies, with falsehood. Those who don't find truth to be beautiful. They find truth to be boring. So they have to turn to lies and falsehood to entertain themselves. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that. Mathalul Jannah The example, the description of paradise. Which Jannah? Which garden? Because remember the word Jannah literally means a garden. Hmm? So when it is said, the description of garden, but which garden? The garden. And the garden, allati which wu'idal muttaqoon, which the righteous have been promised. Those who have taqwa, they have been promised this Jannah, this garden. When is it that a person can develop taqwa? How? Through fasting. Fasting is one of the ways. Hmm? Because, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامِ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ Why? لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So the people who develop taqwa, who live with the consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with the fear of Allah, and with this realization that my Lord is watching me, and this fear is ever present in the heart, it is deeply settled in the heart, With regards to his feelings, he is careful. With regards to his words, he is careful. With regards to his attitude, he is careful. With regards to his physical, facial expressions, he is careful. His actions, he is careful. To so the taqwa, it translates into every aspect of a person's life. Why? Because it's a fear that is deeply settled within the heart. It's a state of a person when he is conscious of his Lord. And if it is deeply in the heart, then it will be manifest everywhere. So the people who live with this kind of consciousness, with this level of being alert, that they're conscious of Allah, fearful of Allah, for them Allah has promised Jannah. What kind of Jannah is it? تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا anhar, Underneath which the rivers flow. Beneath which rivers flow. Meaning it's within their control. Control of the people of paradise. Hmm? that they will have complete control over the rivers of Jannah if they want to be five feet away or five feet closer or bigger or smaller or you know a new one somewhere or it should be shut down they have control over it and tahtiha also means under its homes and its trees meaning rivers, ravines flowing and you know that how much beauty 
just water brings to any garden. Which is why if there is no natural spring or something, then what do people want? There should be at least a fountain or something. Right? Why? Because it brings more beauty. So, تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارِ أُكُلُهَا دَائِمْ Its fruit is eternal. Its fruit is eternal so that it will never end. Has it ever happened with you that you're having a bowl of strawberries that are really nice? Okay? They're perfectly ripe. They taste good. They're not mushy. They're the right flavor. Okay? But then what happens? You have them and then you reach the last one. Hmm? And then you realize that you don't have any more in your refrigerator. And you know that if you want to get the right kind of strawberries, it's going to take another trip to the grocery store. And who knows, that might not be successful because what if those strawberries aren't ripe? Or what if they're extra ripe? The problem with the things of this dunya is that no matter how good they are, they're not eternal. They're not eternal. They do not last. They never last. Even if you go to Costco and buy things in bulk, eventually they will end. Even if your freezer is full, your garage is full, your pantry is full, eventually the goodies will come to an end. And if they're not coming to an end, you want to make sure they finish. Because otherwise they will go bad. But Jannah, the beauty of Jannah, the perfection of Jannah is illustrated in just these two words. Ukuluha da'im. Its fruit is eternal. So you will never have this feeling that, oh, this is going to finish, so I better use it with care. I better, you know, keep my hand away, otherwise this will finish. No, you're relaxed. You're happy. In hadith we learned that once the Prophet ﷺ said that he was made to see Jannah and he was made to see the fruits of Jannah and he wished to take some. He wished to take some of the fruit in order to enjoy it. And he said, were I to take some and bring it to you, he was addressing his companions, then you would eat from it until the day of judgment. That fruit would never end. You would eat from it until the day of judgment. Because whatever fruit it would be, if the Prophet ﷺ brought it to this world, it would never end. Ukuluha da'im. Its fruit is eternal. And you see, the problem in this dunya is also that many things are only seasonal. And when you get them out of season, like for example, strawberries, when you buy them in the winter, you know exactly how they are. They're no fun. Right? Half the box is not good. You never know how they're going to turn out. So you wait for the right season to get the right fruit, but in Jannah, no problem like that. Ukuruha da'im wa zilluha. And its shade also. Meaning its shade is also eternal. Its shade will never end. Meaning it's vast, it's big. And it's not like this dunya where the sun, its position is moving in the sky because of which the shade is also moving. And as a result, you also have to move along with it. Has it ever happened with you that you're sitting under the shade like for example, in your yard, you're sitting under a tree, but then what happens after some time? The shade is also moving. So you have to either get up and go inside or you have to move along with it because you can't be sitting in the sun for very long. But in Jannah, وَظِلُّهَا Its shade is also eternal. تِلْكَ عُقُبَ الَّذِينَ تَقَوْ This is the outcome, this is the result, this is the consequence of those people who have taqwa. وَعُقُبَ الْكَافِرِينَ and the consequence of the disbelievers, that is described in just one word, annaar, fire. Fire. And that is sufficient to tell us what kind of a home it is. Imagine, if there is a home filled with fire, a home filled with fire, is that called a home? Can you live there? Can you stay there? You know that you're going to die any second. You better get out of there. But realizing that you cannot get out of there, وَعُقُبَ الْكَافِرِينَ النَّارِ وَالَّذِينَ آتَيْنَاهُمُ الْكِتَابِ And those people to whom we have given the book. Meaning, the Ahlul Kitab, the Yahud and the Nasara. But remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the book to them, but every one of them has not taken the book as they should have taken it. They have not really accepted the book as they should have accepted it. They have not really believed in the book as they should have believed in it. There are some who believe in it the way it should be believed in, and there are those who just follow their desires, and they call that iman in the books. Just like today, there are many people who claim they believe in the Qur'an, but how is their belief? How is their speech? How are their actions? 
How is their ibadah? Is it according to the Qur'an or does it contradict the Qur'an? So just because Allah has given the book to someone doesn't mean that they have accepted it in the right way. So over here, who is being mentioned? Those who have truly accepted the book correctly. Meaning they believe in it, they adhere to it, they don't pick and choose. So وَالَّذِينَ آتَيْنَاهُمُ الْكِتَابِ Those who have truly received it, يَفْرَحُونَ They rejoice, they are happy. بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ With that which has been revealed to you. Meaning when they learn about the Qur'an, they get even more happy. They rejoice. When is it that you get happy on finding something? When you were really in search of it. When it is according to your taste. Hmm? According to your likes. When you find it, then you get overjoyed. So the people of the book, those who truly believe in their scriptures, when they find out about the Qur'an, what's their reaction? They're happy. They're happy. Why are they happy? Because they have come to know of another word of God, another scripture sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they're overjoyed. يَفْرَحُونَ بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ And obviously if they're happy with it, what does it mean? That they believe in it also. They accept it. Remember the ayah? لِلَّذِينَ اسْتَجَابُوا لِرَبِّهِمْ hmm? For them is husna. So this is istijaba. This is responding to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They find out about the Qur'an and they believe. Because they see how it is so much more beautiful and so much more accurate and so much more beneficial that really it is a book of guidance. And we see that in the life of the Prophet ﷺ, there were many such people who, when they came across the Qur'an, their first reaction was, you know, tears of joy. In the seventh juz we learned, وَإِذَا سَمِعُوا مَا أُنزِلَ إِلَى الرَّسُولِ تَرَى أَعْيُنَهُمْ تَفْيُضُ مِنَ الدَّمْعِ that when they hear that which has been sent down to the messenger, you see their eyes being filled with tears. They cry, and those tears are of happiness. And we see that in Habasha, when the Muslims went, and they spoke to the king of Habasha, what happened when he heard the Qur'an, when he heard the recitation of the Qur'an? He wept. Salman al-Farisi, what was his reaction? He believed. Abdullah bin Salam, what was his reaction? He believed. So we see, regardless of whether they were Jews or Christians, those who truly adhere to their books, when they came across the Qur'an, they had no problem accepting it. But Allah says, وَمِنَ الْأَحْزَابِ And among the groups, meaning different, different kinds of groups, the Jews, the Christians, people of other religions, among the groups are مَنْ هُوْ يُنْكِرُ بَعْضَ There will always be those who deny بَعْضَ Some of it. Meaning they cannot reject all of the Qur'an. They cannot reject all of the Qur'an. They can only reject parts of it. And this is a fact. That even the staunchest disbeliever, when he will read the Qur'an, he cannot but agree with parts of the Qur'an. Okay, there may be certain portions which he says, oh, I don't believe in this, I don't accept it at all. But there are parts which they have to accept. So they cannot reject it fully. مَنْ يُنْكِلْ بَعْضَهُ قُلْ Say, meaning tell these people who reject that إِنَّمَا أُمِرْتُ أَنْ أَعْبُدَ اللَّهِ I have been commanded to worship Allah. وَلَا أُشْرِكَ بِهِ And that I do not associate any with Him. إِلَيْهِ أَدْعُو To Him I call. وَإِلَيْهِ مَآب And to Him is my return. Meaning tell them the message of the Qur'an. Why do they reject parts of the Qur'an? What does the Qur'an tell you to do? Worship Allah alone. What's wrong in that? What does the Qur'an tell you to do? Not associate any partners with Allah. What is wrong with this? This is what people should be doing. So why do these people have a problem with the Qur'an? وَكَذَلِكَ أَنزَلْنَاهُ And thus we have revealed it, meaning this Qur'an, as hukman, as a legislation, as a command, that is Arabian, that is in Arabic. We have revealed this Qur'an as a command, meaning as an instruction which has to be accepted and followed and obeyed. And it is in which language? In the Arabic language. Why? Why did Allah choose the Arabic language? Because of its clarity, because of its eloquence, and also because, as we discussed earlier in Surah Yusuf, because something is expressed in this language cannot be expressed in any other form of communication, any other language at all. And Arabic is a language that is understandable. And especially the first recipients, the people of Arabia, the people of Mecca, what language did they speak? Arabic. So this is the reason why Allah chose Arabic 
Why? So that the people would understand. But yet, there are those who do not wish to understand despite the clarity of the Qur'an. Despite the powerful effect of the Qur'an, they don't believe, they don't accept. They say, oh, we don't understand. It doesn't make sense to us. وَلَا إِنِ اتَّبَعْتَ أَهْوَاءَهُمْ So Allah warns that if you should follow their desires, whose desires? The desires of the people who reject the Qur'an. Because it is not possible that someone rejects the Qur'an based on absolute logic. No, if someone is rejecting the Qur'an, it is because they are following their desires. Because the Qur'an gives ilm and haq. And those who don't want to follow it, what are they doing in reality? Following their desires. So Allah warns, if you follow their desires, بَعْدَمَا جَاءَكَ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ After knowledge has come to you, then مَا لَكَ مِنَ اللَّهِ مِنْ وَلِيٍّ وَلَا وَاقٍ Then you shall not have against Allah any ally, any wali, nor any waq. Who is waq? What's the root? Waqafiya. Same root as the word taqwa. Very good, mashallah. So waqin is one who shields, one who protects. So if you begin to follow their desires after having this knowledge, then you will have no one to protect you. So what does this ayah teach us? That the one who has been given knowledge of the Qur'an, then he must not follow the desires of people. 